Good afternoon. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, can I first please say that I, I need to ask you a big round of applause to the other members of the team, especially Alicia. Alicia is the alma mater. But uh, we have Irina, we have Ali, Miguel, myself, and Kate, both of you, who is not here, and, and Pedro, who is in the Czech Republic. So this is a big team effort, and um, I think uh, it's difficult to imagine another project like this in my, in my life, in my career. I think uh, this is one of the things I feel most proud of, I have to say. Um, the project is called Open Lives. Um, what I said about, uh, about our friend Alicia, um, Alicia uh, was uh, directing, leading a project on oral history of Spanish migrants, people who left Spain and then went back to Spain, many of them, uh, from the end of the 1930s and, you know, to the 1960s. And uh, in that project, um, she actually um, collected a big um, bank of resources, oral history interviews, but also some pictures, drawings, materials from these people who had, you know, kindly offered to tell Alicia and the research team she was leading their life story. Some of them very moving, actually. Um, you have here, this presentation will be available uh, after the after the event, so you, you have there some uh, links to some of the other um, resources related to this research data. And on the basis of that uh, fantastic opportunity for development, uh, there was uh, an application, successful application for funding of GISC. And uh, the Open Life project mm, was given the green light, and uh, the idea was to digitize all the materials, all the interviews that Alicia and Darren had conducted, uh, digitize also the rest of resources that could be interesting for the learning community, create mm, uh, a, a collection of learning resources for related to those oral history interviews, uh, make sure that those learning resources could be used in a variety uh, make sure that those resources could be used in a variety of disciplines, so in a way, um, uh, I don't know if to say this is not the camera, but languages is taken over with this methodology of the subjects, you know. And uh, we, we want this type of methodology to be used in geography, in history, um, even in literature, why not? Um, and it's a collaboration led by Southampton and this subject center, last uh, in collaboration uh, with Boston, the University of Boston, and the University of uh, And that's one of the examples of the final output, I'm going to say final product. This is a home box that's um, a, a, a picture of Henry and Luis, one of our most celebrated research informants in Barcelona. His life is fascinating, his life story is um, educationally invaluable. Uh, our students love it, and you can find a number of resources related to his life, including the full interview of his life. So, um, this is the Open Life project. And then I'd like to say, to say a little bit about the title of the conference, of, of the paper Transformation. It has been transformational for us. It has been transformational for the students. It has been even transformational institutionally. We haven't discussed this first, but it has transformed things in Leeds. Uh, and then the idea is that it is transformational also for us as professionals and for society. There is a very strong social purpose behind this project. It's not only education, it's also social. Uh, and you'll see that in a minute. So I think I, I should leave you now with my colleague Miguel, who is going to tell you about his uh, contribution, the contribution of the University of Fosmo to this project. Do you want me to move the slides for you? It's okay. Well, you don't I think I'm, I'm, I'm fine here. Okay. 
Uh, I would like to say exactly the same as, as Antonio. I think that we work together in the various projects, which is the one project that has touched me. Not only me, myself, but also I think start my students as well. I think that that's, that's, I think that that's probably because of the human nature of, of the project. Um, what we did with this, um, with this uh, material that Alicia collected was to integrate um, these as resources, to create open resources within a already existing uh, unit at Corpus University. It is in the second year, so uh, it was uh, a student's uh, had to research an NGO company or profession, it was already existing as I said, and produce a magazine plus an oral presentation plus a video in level three. Um, I gave them the possibility of using these materials, the materials that we had, the interviews, uh, the photographies, to create a project about the Niños de la Guerra. And out of the 38 level two students who took the uni, 14 produced this project, decided to produce this project. The others, well, decided to go onto the NGO or a kind of more market-oriented project. Uh, that was assessed, and I have to be very, very quickly. Uh, we can discuss that later on about the details if you want to know more. So uh, it was assessed. Uh, we, they had a 30% uh, oral report, uh, production of agendas and minutes in the target language, and then the final product, which was a magazine that you will see, uh, was worth 70% of the final mark. <coughs> what the students used was the interviews conducted by Alicia Pozo, uh, transcript of Germinal's interview by Pedro Garcia Vidal. Uh, Germinal is, is one of the children of the war. They use uh, the We Came Along article edited by Manuel Corsino, another children of the war. Uh, drawings by Germinal Luis, a student produced interview to Germinal, and they conducted as well in addition their own researchers in books journals, etc., websites, etc. So I think that the, the one thing that made a difference is that our students, I mean, we wanted to invite Herminal. Herminal is such a nice character. Uh, we, we got in touch with him. He's living history, and, and his history is so fascinating, so human. It's gone, it's living halfway, uh, well, in many countries in the world. And, the students uh, wanted to interview him. We invited Herman out. He couldn't come because he's 83. He was experiencing some health problems. So then I asked my students to recall the questions. I took the questions, went to Barcelona and interviewed Herman out there. So I think that you could see a little bit of the interview that our students prefer. This is the work. <laughs> Hay momentos que me siento más venezolano, sí, hay momentos, porque a fin de cuentas pues desde adentro estamos a una cantidad de años en Venezuela, más de medio siglo en Venezuela, y mis hijas y todo el mundo, mis amigos más íntimos, todo el venezolano, y además que es un país muy bello, muy bello. So that gives us an idea. There weren't many other uh, questions. So the questions have been assigned by the students, created by them, and then just I put them, I read them out, and they got the feedback from uh, Herminal. Yeah? So uh, I'm going to give you an example because I think that the students, the students are much better at explaining how they felt that I can. Uh, so during the uh, progress report interview, we videoed that. And this is what the students have to say about the project. How it works. Don't tell me it's not going to work. Oh. It will work. You think? Yeah. If not, the file is uh, work. You can click the file. Oh, okay. okay. How is it in the folder? Is it it says end show, it's not the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. And they're all in the home box anyway. Yeah. Para yeah. mí era, no, me, me parece muy. 
muy interesante investigar lo que, lo que ocurrió para él en Francia, porque soy estudiante de francés y de, lo, de los estudios um, franceses, y para mi disertación voy a investigar la vida en Francia, y por esta razón um, me presentó un, otra, no sé, otra visión de lo que ocurrió para los niños de la guerra, para los españoles que, que tenían que escapar um, la dictadura de Franco. Así que, sí, me pareció que, me pareció que era un, un, no sé, una historia muy compleja. ¿Cuál es el aspecto más difícil de este um, proyecto? Diría que el aspecto más difícil era unir todas las fuentes porque um, la mayoría son muy generales, así que es bastante, al principio es bastante difícil comprenderlos y unirlos con lo, lo que sabemos de germinal y quería, es, es que quería verlos de un punto de vista um, histórico pero general para que se puede ver los vehículos entre lo que, lo que se, se estaba um, ocurriendo yendo en, en España y, y para germinar, es decir, era bastante difícil ver um, los, la, los vehículos entre la historia personal y la historia general, nacional, etc. Era muy muy interesante y aprendido mucho sobre la guerra y los niños de la guerra. Um, era realmente un, un placer hablar con Um, germinal y ver <coughs> la entrevista. ¿Cómo has investigado el proyecto y qué fue? O sea, yo creo que esto nos da. I should have said that obviously Germinal escaped from the Spanish Civil War when he was a child. He went to France, from France obviously had to escape went to the United States and finally he reunited with his parents in Venezuela when he was 17. So, and then finally he went back to his roots, Barcelona, where, is, where he lives now. So, um, this is the end product. And I think that the fact that students had access to this human history made the whole difference. Mm -hmm. uh, they they learned history to the personal history of Germinal, and that motivated that. And I think that that's a perfect example of how content and language integrated learning can occur in, in, in the classroom context. So let's have a look at the magazines that they produce in the end. I've got the originals here, in just in case you want to, to see them, if it works. <laughs> Antonio, save me. <laughs> well, it's the link to files. It's the link on the internet. Yes. Why don't we take example, the real example? Okay, it's right. nice. Actually, but is it my? Okay, okay. okay. Well, this is the I'll say something in the meantime. Have you have you heard what the girl was saying about living the life of Herminal and the sources? They are very general. That makes you actually think about the value of the teaching of history in higher education, you know, what's the relationship with humans, what's the relationship with life. Mm -hmm. She was struggling to make the connection between the life of that person who escaped war, you know, and what she knows about history. So it's not just about integrating content and language, this is actually making content meaningful. Yeah. Exactly. And as well, this girl, I mean, she was a student of the Spanish and French, which meant that because Calvinal escaped from Spain and was living in France, she could establish the connection to both <coughs> her area of studies, yeah? uh, and that was really, really rich for her, mm -hmm. and it helped her even with her dissertation. This is a type of uh, pamphlet that they, they ended up with, uh, very professionally done. Uh, you can have a look at that later on. So what they use is um, the information, all copyright, all uh, free, open resources, and um, obviously available to you if you want to use them. But I think that that was... The in the room box, yeah, in the room box, yeah. So let's continue. 
Okay, the problems that we had was very briefly copyright and quality. Some of the, most of the material was copyright free, because the FDA had cleared that, but some of them it wasn't, so we can reduce that. Uh, factual historical errors, there were quite a few of those. And then the ethics of the interview, uh, we had to protect our interviews. So some of the questions they wanted me to ask her me now, I couldn't ask. So I had to fill the books. And then there is some problems of plagiarism, but they were minimal. So what we have here is a model of open, open resources production. So you can see that resource at the very top was produced by level two students. Then the idea is that these resources are going to be um, repurposed by grade three students, by non year students, so they will look at the content, they will look at the stakes, they will perhaps um, add some more content, some more pictures, and then once that has been uh, finalized, then it can go to be used as materials for our first year students reading comprehension, cultural awareness, content and language integrated learning. And then of course it goes to the OER bank, handbox, community, etc. So what we have is a case of is a cycle, complete cycle of resource uh, production. Advantages, collaboration across level institutions, because that video was produced by Portsmouth, title interviews by the students of the University of Southampton. So what we have here is a clear collaboration between Fortune and Southampton, the students, a student collaboration. Uh, what? No. No. Uh, no. Well, you can oh. use for different you can use this for different purposes, face to face, independent learning for research. You can uh, use it for language. We can use it for language, content language, integrated learning, for translation, for subtitling, uh, skills. Well, obviously, what you have is language skills, research skills, uh, professional. You, they have to negotiate editing, they start publishing. So it's a very complete exercise. So much so, and so impressed were some of my colleagues at the University of Portland with the results and the motivation of these students that we decided to create this type of unit as a potential alternative to the dissertation. Uh, the LPC2 will become now what we will call uh, a uh, true designated research unit. So students can do a designated research unit plus a shorter project or the traditional dissertation. And I think that many of them will, will go for this type of option. And that's about well, uh, and, um, at least um, I've done two things. One of them is to create uh, a number of autonomous learning activities and learning activities related to the module I'm going to talk about. And I have created a module or a unit, as they call it in other places, uh, 20 credits uh, in final year uh, Spanish programs. Uh, and it has been a relatively popular option. The students are already taking that module. Um, and um, the first thing I have to say is that uh, in the abstract, I promise uh, that this would be transformational teaching. I could prove that this teaching was transformational. And also, I was going to talk about integration of content, research, skills, language. Um, I think the easiest way for me and for you is I'll concentrate a little bit on what the students do and how we do it week by week. So there are three slides like this showing what we do in the module. We introduce the Open Labs collection in Homebox and they get to see Alicia's work and all the interviews in Homebox, etc. Just an overview. Then we talk about economic migration from Spain during the front of the gym. This module has a different focus, it's on economic migration. Uh, and then I give the students uh, samples of the interviews of Open Labs so that they can choose their favorite slot within each interview that they comment and get familiar with the, with the materials and explain to everybody else why they are interested in that particular part of the interview. It's about 
familiarizing them, getting them familiar with the materials, with the research. Then we get into oral history. Obviously, oral history is a discipline that um, was born as, a, as an alternative to traditional history. Traditional history is to this, the process is usually from a national perspective. Uh, oral history was created to reflect uh, and um, disseminate the lives of those individuals who have been in a situation of marginalization, mm, or have been in a situation, enduring a situation of pain. And uh, it was it started to be very popular in the 1960s with people ha that happened into uh, the Vietnam War, or people who had suffered ethnic discrimination. And then um, epistemologically, morally, ethically, it's a great alternative to traditional history. It has its own methodology, its own social ethos, and uh, I think students should not study history of any kind, contemporary history of any kind, without this exceptional source or of history and this methodology, because it, it makes it makes history to make sense. Uh, so we use open educational resources produced in other places. I'm not an expert. Well, I'm becoming an expert now, but I'm not the expert that I should have been in oral history. So I've used the best open educational resources. Penny Summerfield, Professor Penny Summerfield in Manchester. She had a fantastic presentation and lecture. Uh, we had a lot of books that students read and reflect upon what it means, the social, ethical purpose of um, oral history. Then we continue to study uh, some of the uh, we study the, the, the context that the students need to uh, understand, be aware of, for what comes at the end of the module. At the end of the module, the students have to produce a documentary based on the lives of the Spanish migrants that have arrived in Leeds in the last years because they don't have a job in Spain and they want to find one here. So, there are a lot of people coming from Spain in the last years here, and we want to know their life, we want to know their story, we want to know, you know their suffering, and we want to know their intercultural experiences, etc. So it's using the methodology of uh, Alicia for the people who escaped war, or we have also some of them economic migrants in the 1960s, going to France or Germany. We want to apply all that to the current situation. And the students at the end have to produce a podcast in which they have uh, soundtracks of the interviews that they are doing now. In fact, tomorrow we have another one. And uh, if they want, they can also use soundtracks of the original Open Lives interviews to illustrate whatever they want to say. So, obviously, uh, in semester one, we talk about preparation of interviews, ethic protocols. The students have seen all the ethic forms that I have prepared to be able to do all this research with real people, uh, with common lay people. Uh, the recent economic and social crisis in Spain, all the students need to understand all this because when they confront the person who is going to be telling them about losing their job and the uh, financial crisis and the uh, banking crisis with the housing uh, boom, etc., etc., they need to be able to understand that context. Uh, coding interviews, analyzing them, identifying, identifying themes, and uh, we obviously organize ourselves as project meetings. Because many of these decisions are taken by students, they have to be taken by them. We meet uh, in a classroom like this and we discuss so everything that needs to be done, participatory recruitment, etc. So that's semester one. And then January the 9th, they presented a 750 research project, which is assessed. I gave them already the feedback. Mm -hmm. On Wednesday, we did an interview with somebody who was an architect, lost, lost his job in Spain, and he's now in Leeds looking for things. He's been a cleaner, he's been all sorts of things. And uh, we have another one tomorrow with a girl from Barcelona. Uh, we'll do probably one or more, too, but everything is being done as a team. So there are two students or three who interview, some others are in charge of transcribing, then they rotate. Uh, everybody's doing a little bit of everything. And uh, what we're going to do when they do the interviews and they have the feedback, which they have already of, my, of, the, of the first assessed piece, is that they will talk about that feedback, present informally all the feedback that I gave them to everybody else orally and talk about their project and how these interviews are going to impact in the project. And 
And then once it, once it done that informally, then they have a formal oral presentation, which will be at the end of February, in which they move forward and take in, closing the feedback loop, take in all the commentaries, all the comments from students, all the things that other students have been talking about in the, in, uh, regarding the project, and my feedback. Trojan horse, very important image of this motion. Five, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So, uh, after Easter, sorry, uh, just before Easter, we obviously do a practical session on documentaries, what type of documentaries, pragmatics, jobs, um, editing, software, and uh, obviously publishing, or yeah, intellectual property rights, publishing uh, open educational resources, because we want to make sure that the final output which is a documentary that the students feel proud of, a documentary that is going to be shared with the world, mm, that is something that has been given on the scaffolding mm, in terms of support and learning uh, throughout the module. Uh, students submit a script, I give them feedback, and then they submit the final version of the script in a podcast. So what happens with the documentary? Do they just go into the home box and publish it? Well, I have to say that um, the impact of this project has gone beyond the students and the teachers. For instance, one example, uh, in the University of Leeds, I'm a member of the steering group for Open Educational Resources, and we have drafted a policy that has been officially approved for the whole of the institution, which is a unique thing in the country, having a comprehensive overall policy approved at the highest level for Open Educational Resources. And in that policy, we have taken into account all these things that we are doing with the students so that it is covered. In many other places, perhaps, you will have to fight your way to convince managers and heads of the schools that actually the students can publish and should publish and should be encouraged to publish open educational resources. So we, we come through that hurdle thanks to open that. And uh, the trick of the, well, the trick, there is a little trick there. I don't want students to publish open educational resources until they got the mark for the final year course, yeah, and everything is done because I don't want them to feel the pressure of having to publish their work to please me because they know I like open educational resources. There's a very ethical, you know, dilemma there. So there is a window of time, which is once the course has finished and the marks are out, and uh, the graduation day, in that window of time, they can come and see me, and if they want, they can publish it and disseminate it with the community. Uh, so, transformational. In what ways is it transformational? And I'll finish with all this. Yeah, so it's a, a full cycle, complex process of student research, production, uh, and we obviously close the feedback loop in many ways. Uh, it is socially relevant for the students, personally relevant for the students. It makes a difference for society because we are documenting something that probably nobody else will document because the media have a way of dealing with migration and economic problems, politicians, let's not talk about that, and historians, God knows what they'll say about this period. Um, the pupil, the student, becomes a researcher, becomes a producer, following the idea of Mike Mary, and they become actually public authors. Uh, it's knowledge that is constructed socially, is ethical knowledge, eh, because it's being produced ethically and it has an ethical purpose. Uh, and it prepares for life, empowerability. Uh, you, you've seen that I haven't talked about employability. I've talked about uh, skills, perhaps, or empowerability. Making sure that students are prepared for life mm, and to take options and make uh, the best of their knowledge and the, and, the, and the beliefs and the values and their capabilities. Uh, employability is fine, but it's only a small part of the type of education that our students should receive in terms of skills. And the skills that they learn, uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I talked the other day about this issue of uh, the labeling of the skills. The skills are not just professionals. I mean, there's not differentiation between academic skills and professional skills. I think some academics don't have the skills that they should have and then they need to go and import the skills from other places like corporations. But I think there are many other academics here, we can see many of them, 
who have so many skills that we don't really need to establish this differentiation between academic skills and professional skills. So we are providing a skill, it's full stop. Yeah, and our skills are as good or better than anybody else's. And transformation, don't go back, don't go back. Un segundo, just a second. So transformation for us, we become language and content specialists, is the Trojan horse of languages into content. This is the way social science should be taught, yeah? not just language. We become research practitioners, we become oral historians, academic educators, ethics and ethical educators, skills educators, and also social impact. So we are doing all these things with this, with this module. Uh, and what on? If somebody doesn't feel like doing this next year because they think this is a bit too much, I've done it, it's fine, but it's a bit tiring. You have, you can taste the water with an autonomous learning activity, yeah, that you can interview with your students, uh, and it's a home box. And you present students with the task of presenting some of this work that actually ha doesn't have really a presentation in itself, presenting it to different communities and different groups and different audiences. And not on. And that's it, I think. Yeah, and thank you to Jess for coming. Yes. Lash, Kate, <laughs> Alicia, Ali, Pedro, Irina, and the University of Southampton, and the people of the pictures. Thank you very much. Until I started working with these guys and with Ali and Kay, and, and I saw the potential, I thought there was meaning to this. I was under the pressures of getting yet more funding, get, gathering more data, and then all this material, all these life stories were being shelved and, and were gathering dust. And that was causing a lot of troubles for me personally. So I've recovered a bit of my, it's been transformational for me as well because yes. I have recovered a bit of faith in academia and universities. A little bit, I'm still very disaffected in many respects, <laughs> but this is an area where mm, pedagogically there's still hope, there's still a bit of light, I think, if, if we follow these models of work. Yeah, and it's all, it's all there in humbox.ac.uk. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.